If He can take us out of Egypt, certainly there's not going to be any days that we're wondering where the water's coming from. If He can get us out of Egypt, the Egyptians won't chase after us. If He can get us out of Egypt, they get out there and they find out it's not always the easy way. Right. <clears throat> they thought God's way would be the easy way. In Exodus chapter 14, and we find in verse number 11, and they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is it not the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us belong, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. The easy way. They thought, boy, we want freedom. We want out of Egypt. We're tired of the bondage of Egypt. But when the going got rough, they said, oh no, that's not what we gained. That's not what we bargained for. I did not bargain for this. I thought, I, matter of fact, we told you when it started getting a little bit rough and they told us that we had to uh, find our own straw to make the bricks. We told you then, we didn't want any of this. We'd rather be under bondage to the sin and of the world than ever have the freedom because it's not the easy life. Well, what if, there would have, if, what if everything would have went easy for them? What if everything never would have been any hardships? What if, would have not, if they would have just come and the Red Sea would have automatically opened before they got stopped there? If it would have automatically opened, they would have went right on through? If there would have been plenty of water and then not ever having any bitter water? And they would have just kept on going? And they would have marched along and all the enemies out in the wilderness would have been put to death? And there wouldn't have ever been any serpents or anything out there in the wilderness? What if that would have been the catch? What about that? That's what they were looking for. Can I tell you, there's many a person who wants to get saved so they can get out of hell, but they don't realize that salvation is not always the easy life. All they give God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's times you can't go where the rest of the world goes. There's times you can't do what they do. You can't see what they see and still enjoy the Lord. They thought God's way would be the easy way. Chapter 16 and verse number 3 of the book of Exodus, he says, And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we had sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat to the full. For ye have brought us forth in this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. It wasn't as easy as they thought it would be. They became desensitized. They became diffident, lack of confidence. Because they thought that God's way would be the easy way. That God's will would be the easy way. They thought that God's way would be the Egyptians' way. They thought God would do it like the Egyptians did it. In Numbers chapter 11, in Numbers chapter 11, I find this to be so. That they're over here saying these things that God, thinking in God's way, would be like the Egyptians' way. In verse number 5, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried up. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. God supplying every need they have. He's feeding them with food, but it's not the Egyptian way. The Egyptian says, the Egyptian way says, hey, you can have all you want of all these things, but you're staying in bondage. Enjoy what I have for you, but you're still my slave. You're still my servant. See, the Egyptian way, the Egyptians did not just uh, make sure that they work, but the Egyptians made sure they were fed. 
with what they wanted to eat. They made sure you had to eat. That's the Egyptian way. Let me say this. The Egyptians seem to have it all. The Egyptians seem to have everything that they wanted now when they found out that God's way was not the Egyptian way. In verse number 20 of Numbers 11, he said, But even a whole month... Wait a minute. Let me make sure that's right. Yep, yeah, he says, But even a whole month until it comes out of, our nostril, of your nostrils, and it be loathsome unto you, because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before Him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? They wept, saying, Why did we come out of Egypt? We like the Egyptian way. Let me say that faith life is not the Egyptian way. The faith life is not. I'll just throw this one out to you. The, the Egyptian way says save so you can get. God's way says give and it shall be given. The world says just keep on taking. Get everything you can get from them. Be a deal maker, not a peacemaker. Numbers 14. In verse number 4. I believe it is. And they said to one another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. I'd rather be in bondage doing it the Egyptian way. That's what they said. They become desensitized and diffident to God's will. They become desensitized and diffident toward God's Word. Today, if you will hear His voice, pardon not your heart. My sheep hear my voice. When God says something, they got to the place, did God really say that? Did God really mean what He said? Is that not what happens? Was it not trying to take away the confidence in God's Word that the devil used to get Eve to, to, uh, to eat of that fruit? Did God really say that? Not only did He really say that, did God really mean that? Or was God just saying, hey, I don't want you to have be as like me. And so I'm going to hold you down. That's how the, that's what happens. You become desensitized to God's Word. As He speaks to your heart. As He speaks through the preaching. As He speaks through the Scriptures. Now listen, when God speaks to your heart, we ought to be sensitive, but then we ought to confirm everything that God says in our heart. Does it line up with the Scriptures? When God speaks through preaching, and we believe God is saying something through the preaching of the Word of God, you receive the Word that's already in mind and search the Scriptures daily where those things are so. But what do you do when the Scripture says it? There's no place else to go. Thus saith the Scriptures. And when you become desensitized to that, and different at not having confidence in that, in the Scriptures, then what do you mean? You become hard. Hard. The more you become desensitized, the more they become different. The more they become lose confidence. The more you lose confidence, the more you become desensitized. The farther you go into sin, this is an anything type of sin, the more you sit there and say, well, it ain't hurt me a little bit that time. Not know until it already costs. A person does not get drunk until he gets one drink drunk. 
Somebody says, oh, no, I'm not drunk. I only drank one beer. All right? So you pop another one and say, oh, I'm not. And then the next thing you know, you're drunk because you've been deceived by sin. The deceitfulness of sin. One beer drunk is drunk. You say, but it didn't affect me. Then number two wouldn't affect you. Because it's only one beer. I mean, people don't... It compounds itself. A little leaven, leaven it the whole lump. It doesn't take much. The first thing you do, and I use the example, the first thing you do, is you see some, some guy see some young girl, he likes her, and, and so he says, I'll carry her books home from school. Now I know this is old school. They don't have books in school anymore. Most of them don't even know how to read and how to text. They can't even read real words. But that's beside the point. Now I know I'm going to exaggerate a little bit, but they don't have books. They have computers, tablets, or something like that. When I thought of tablets, I always thought of a big T that you write the big letters on, that you learn how to write. But they got these tablets, so this boy carries her tablet home for her. Next thing you know, which is a good thing, he's holding her hand. Next thing you know, he's slipping his arm around her. Next thing you know, he's giving her peck on the cheek. If it just stayed with being a gentleman and carrying her books, no problem. But one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. If you don't see it, to you. How did we end up here? How did I end up in this situation? The question, the answer is, I allowed a little in and a little bit went far. The problem, the possibility leads to a problem. The problem leads to a product. Verse number 14, there's no partaking of Christ. Look at what he says. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. And there's no peace in our heart. Verses 18 and 19. To whom, he, to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now when I say no partaker, they were not partakers of Christ. No partaker of Christ. This is a personal relationship and fellowship. We already know they're partakers of the heavenly calling. We already know they're holy brethren. He's talking to brethren. But all of a sudden now, you're not enjoying the Lord. There's no fellowship. There's no enjoying Him. And God is trying to teach us that if we, the product of letting these things happen, letting this problem happen, becomes a no partaking of Christ. We don't enjoy Him anymore. We enjoy our sin and do not enjoy our Savior. Say, so how does that happen? I use an example. A guy marries his girl. They having a great time. Then his buddy start asking him to go hunting with them. Now he enjoyed hunting back before he met this girl. But he gave up most of his hunting and so he limited himself to one time a year to go hunting because he knew he liked it. 
But then somebody said, oh, we're going this weekend. He said, okay. And he goes this weekend. And the next thing you know, he's going the next weekend. And he's going back out there and he becomes a hunting addict. And I'm not against hunting. But he becomes so into this hunting that he's ignoring his wife. He has to buy himself new guns. Got to buy himself the new hunting gear, and his wife is going to uh, to Goodwill, which he used to be able to buy, which he used to buy at Walmart. And she's going to Goodwill, and she doesn't even have enough money to buy the used products there because he is spending her the hard-earned money on hunting stuff. But when he had his first love, his love for his wife, and she was consumed with her, and he was sanctified unto her. But now he separated himself unto hunting. And she's secondary. Don't say it doesn't happen. I've watched it. I've watched it with fishing, hunting, biking, all kinds of exercise, working out. It can be anything. I'm not, I, I mean, now God is talking about things that are sinful here. The unbelief brings us to this other thing. And all of a sudden there's no more fellowship with Christ. Because now you come home to go meet with Him and say, I don't want to meet with you, Lord. And He's busy with everything else. You say, no, God's not like that. What is a man? He's got feelings. You ignore him. What makes you so sure that God is going to not ignore you, son? He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's always going to be there. But is there going to be that sweet fellowship? Is he going to be as close as it was before without your repentance? Without you getting right, without you willing to start saying, I'm going to spend time with Him instead of spending time with whatever else it is. No partaking of Christ, therefore no peace in our hearts. Take heed. Take heed. Take heed, brother. It's a warning. Give more a seed to the things you've heard this any time and let them slip. Don't let it slip away. Don't let him slip away. If he has, labor therefore to enter back into that rest. If you let it slip away, then it's going to take some work saying, Dear God, I want that rest that I had with you, that peace I had, that partaking I had. I want it. And Lord, I'm willing to give up whatever it is that I might have you and have that sweet fellowship with you. He tells us in verse chapter 4, labor therefore to enter into that rest. He says there remains a rest for the people of God. He tells us that we could have that rest. Let us therefore fear lest there is promise being left us to enter into this rest any should seem to come short of it. I mean, He warns us, He challenges us and then he tells us, labor to enter into that rest. Because every one of us can find that sometime in our life we start slipping, drifting, allowing sometimes our service to the Lord become more important than our sweet fellowship with the Lord. Sometimes finding some type of besetting sin taking our life. He says labor therefore to the rest. Work at getting this thing back to where it is. Because he has desire to give you rest. He's promised us he'll never leave us nor forsake us. But if you don't want to fellowship you don't want that sweet peace to partake of Him in a personal, intimate way to have His peace rest flooding your soul. You don't want that. 
He'll let you go about your own way. He'll let me go about my own thing. Until I come to the place I'm tired of and I say, dear God, help me. Then he says, I'm not left. I'm still here. I will never, never, never leave me for sake. He will always keep his back. Because he loves us. He will never last him. Take you, brother. Take you. Please. Father, I pray you do what I want you to do.